Hello there, my name is David Thompson from the Fraser Valley in British Columbia. I am here to announce a new book that I have up on Amazon Kindle, but it's going to be far more than just announcing the book. I am here also to give a message by the prophetic moving of the Holy Spirit as I speak here to the body of Christ. It's certainly going to be focused around this book that I have just put up for the first time as an e-book on Amazon Kindle. And so I first of all just want to show you the title of the book and name it. It's God Headship in Body Invasion. In case you can't see it, God Headship in Body Invasion. And that book is the paperback that I just showed you here, which is a not-for-retail copy that I got, is online, both in paperback and as an ebook. But also, I want you to be aware that the ebook is free until June the 9th, which is Tuesday at midnight. You can get the ebook for free until June the 9th. If you're in Canada where I live, you need to go to Amazon.ca to go to the Kindle there to get the ebook. All you need to do is type into Google Amazon.ca and the name Kindle and then click on the link. And then when you get to the search box in Amazon, simply type in the title of the book in God Headship in Body Invasion. I want to share a little bit about what's in this book and about some of the other books that I will be having come out a lot sooner than it took me a long time from the time I put the printed version of this book up until I got the Kindle ebook up there and that is because I went through a lot of technical learning and hoops and everything else to convert it from in design, in print format, to an electronic ebook. Actually, the easiest, easiest way to do things is not to start as a print book and a professional program like InDesign, but to use some of the less expensive programs and do your book in uh, something like OpenOffice, which is free, in your, uh, and save it in DOCX format. And then you can get many ex inexpensive programs. There's Jutoad, and there's Calibri, and others that are free that are very effective at creating ebooks. And Sigil is another one, uh, S I G I L or something like that. So anyhow, um, now the other the reason this book took a long time to convert into electronic is because the whole book is in the form of a long outline. If you look here, it is an outline format. And uh, that outline continues in this book for 218 or more pages, 220 pages. Of course, there is more pages when you add the introduction and everything, but thereabouts. But I'm very impressed with the electronic version of this ebook because I have other ebooks I read on my Android phone. And one of my favorite ebooks is the book Imagine Heaven by John Berkey. I would highly recommend for anyone to read that book. It's well over, I believe, 400 pages, as is this book on my phone when I read it as opposed to reading it as a print form, which is a little over 200 pages. I did notice a mistake up on Amazon saying that this book is 400 some odd pages. It's not, it's 200 some odd pages. So much for the introduction of my book. And the reason I wrote this book was because there was an urgency in me. See, there's other books I have written that are far more extensive in depth than this one. This was the last book I wrote. The other books I've been writing, some of them for probably a decade. Um, but this book became the first one because I felt there was such an urgency. Because what this book is about is, it's an outline 
a long outline of everything that should be in a local assembly of believers. Pretty well everything. I'm sure there's more things that will be added as time goes on. It's in order to not limit the fullness of the headship of Christ from inhabiting the local assembly. We want to be aligning ourselves with the zeal and the passion of God's heart, which is John 17. It is that he desires a bride that is pure and spotless. And in the last days before the Lord returns, it says that praise will spring forth to him around the world as the buds blossom forth in a garden. And also in Isaiah it says, As truly as I live, says the Lord, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And believe me, God will have local assemblies around the world that will become a gathering that allows the fullness of God's headship, the Almighty's One, Elohim, to inhabit the body of Christ, Jesus Christ the Head, to inhabit the local assembly with His glory. And of course, many of us know of accounts in church history, such as the Welsh Revival and Azusa Street, and how the glory of God came down in that time and powerfully impacted the whole community and city and nation It went around the world. And there's prophecies from Azusa Street and I'm sure from other places that were given back in those days saying that in a hundred some odd years there would be a far greater revival than what happened in Azusa Street that would spread around the world. Well, this book is written to facilitate this happening. It is written to awaken us as individuals. As it says in Isaiah, gross darkness shall cover the peoples. But when that happens, it says in Isaiah 60, to the people of God, it gives a command, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. When we choose to wake up out of our sleep and to shine, the glory of God will come on us as individuals and also corporately in our gatherings when we are open to allowing the fullness of the Holy Spirit to operate in our midst. When those that are in leadership are totally sensitive to Christ, the head, to allow the Spirit to move through the local assembly. And this book is written as a template that can be used to bring a local assembly in alignment with the zeal and passion of God's heart for these last days. Woe unto those that would stand in the way of and oppose the passion and the zeal of God in these last days for His bride. It is so obvious that darkness is coming upon the earth as never before. I mean, look at what's happening in the United States right now with all the riots in almost every major city. Talk about gross darkness. It is so obvious that the wheat and the tares have become mature because it is so evident that people are either very dark and evil and twisted in their thinking or, on the other hand, walking in the light as Christ is in the light. Look at the political correctness and groupthink and the insanity of it. That people embrace things that are to their very own destruction in the stubbornness and rebellion of their heart against the ultimate manifestation of love, Jesus Christ. It is interesting, even the ones that are instigators in these riots, their uh, program was discovered and read like the ones that are using Lewinsky and others like the, you know, all of these different groups. And the last part of it was dethrone God. Even that book written by Lewinsky, which is a program that many of these radical groups use, 
is at the beginning in the original book said that our rebellion is against God and on the side of Satan. It said it in the original introduction. So it's very clear that there's the maturation of the sons of light, the sons and daughters of light, and those that are of darkness. We see that the time is urgent, and it is time for us as the body of Christ to awaken. And this is written as a trumpet call to awaken you as an individual to your ultimate destiny, to fulfill it, and as a corporate body of believers, to fulfill it in whatever community or city or town you're in, that we would so gather together that we would allow the presence and glory of God to come down in our midst, so that it would literally break the darkness over our city and community as it did in the Welsh Revival, as it did at Azusa Street, but even in a far greater way, because the Lord is promising in these last days, for a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We see that indicated in Revelations chapter 14, where there's the vision of someone sitting in a cloud like unto the Son of Man with a golden crown in his head, and the command is given to put forth the sickle and reap the harvest. And that is the first reaping. And then, of course, after that, if you, as you read Revelations 14, you have another coming, angel coming that has power over fire and he is called to reap the grapes of wrath and then to trod them and bring them to judgment. And so it is that we are living in a time before the mighty outpouring of the Spirit because that cloud that is described in Revelations 14 is also indicated in other, other parts of Scripture and it's in relation to to the latter rain. Ask of me clouds, bright clouds of rain in the time of the latter rain, and the Lord promises that he will do that for those who are thirsty to receive it. So I'm calling you to awake out of your sleep. Wherefore would you spend money for that which is not bread, and labor for that which does not satisfy? Ho, oh, everyone that thirsts, come ye to the waters, come, buy wine, buy milk, buy honey, without money and without price. Why would you hewn out cisterns that have cracks, that can hold no water, that quench your thirst and your hunger for God with the loves of this world, the gods of amusement, watching sports, idolizing sports figures, spending all your time and energy on that instead of praying and seeking God. The Word of God commands us to redeem the time and that is not redeeming the time. That is robbing you from those things that count for eternity. And God is not satisfied that we just fulfill our duty and we could have a life of lots of prayer and involvement in the church and so on and even feel the presence of God and be filled with the Holy Spirit but not have that first love. And so become like the unwise virgins that have a full measure of oil, but not the extra oil. Not the one that goes the extra mile, like Rachel did to draw water. For that one that was to become her bridegroom. God wants us to be those that are lavishly in love with Him in these last days, that have humility and the fear of God, that come before Him like the woman that broke the alabaster box, the woman that wiped the tears, wiped with her tears and her hair the feet of Christ. It's not enough to just come to the meetings and start with singing and have lots of joy or whatever. How about us forgetting about the pre service prayer meetings and just making God's house a house of prayer? where we start the meeting on our faces in humility before God and become more conscious that Christ is in our midst than any spiritual leader or program that we're about to do on stage. That we become sensitized to whose presence we are in. And then out of great humility and sensitivity, know the moving of the Spirit in our hearts to rise up and pray out, to rise up and sing a song that is inspirational, that is not forethought, 
that is under the moving of the Spirit or give a prophetic word, to rise up in great liberty and in great praise, to move in the gifts of the Spirit, Paul the Apostle said that God has so tempered the body together that he gives more abundant honor unto the part that lacks to the intent that there would be no schism in the local assembly. God is calling us in these last days, like I bring out in this book, to allow the mountains to come down and the valleys to be raised up. The mountains are those that tend to be looked up to because of their gift and their talent and their wonderful, attractive personality. And there's nothing wrong with those things and there's nothing wrong with in respect and appreciation looking up to such. But God is calling us as leaders that tend to be looked up to to be in that place of humility where we are not standing in the way of what God wants to do. And those that seem to be dejected and do not have any talent or attractive personality or looks or whatever it is. They may have all of those things and still be like a valley. Because of what they've been through in their life. Filled with wounds of hurt and rejection. But God is calling those that are like the valley to be raised up. It's like the one that Paul the Apostle described. The one that is least esteemed, God pours more abundant honor on. That can only happen when there is a total sensitivity with the leadership and the assembly to who is in our midst. To be in that place where we allow a sensitivity to Christ and a sensitivity to one another so that we become one voice and one mouth before God. I mean, I have experienced this actually happen, and there's very few churches, but because throughout my life I've sought to be in churches that are in alignment with these things, I have been in congregations, one particularly in North Vancouver, which I still greatly love and appreciate, North Shore Christian Center. In their Sunday morning meetings, they would allow the Holy Spirit to move in the meetings so that anyone had the freedom to cry out a prayer or to sing out a song or to give a prophecy. And as this happened, it was amazing what happened because we didn't know that the other person, what the other person was going to share. But what they were going to share was the very thing we were going to share in a slightly different way, obviously. And what this person was going to share, and it all started to come into harmony. We were sharing the same thing. And the pastor didn't know that these prophetic words would come forth, but his message was on that. And this happened many a time there. That there was that kind of oneness. And God wants to bring us in to such a oneness with Christ and each other that we can see the mighty outpouring of the latter rain of the Holy Spirit come into our midst to the point that we are so knit together in love that as the Word of God says that we with all saints should comprehend the height and the depth and the breadth of God's love. What for? So that we might be filled with all the fullness of Christ. With all the fullness of God. It is then that we will see the greater and the mightier works. And we won't go out with our own programs. But we will go out as individuals and as little groups or corporately under the leading and the power of the Holy Spirit to break the darkness in our communities. And maybe in these last days, to literally lay down our lives as we are persecuted. But God can put in us such fearlessness and boldness and love for Him and others that it is easy to lay down our own lives that others may be saved. Whatever God calls us to do in these last days, His grace is made perfect in our humility where we bring our weakness before Him instead of hiding it. And God is calling His people to come in alignment and wake up and not be satisfied with a typical congregational service but come into the new order that He has for these last days.
what is in this book, are many practical things. It's a template for planning new churches. It's a template, even if you're a denomination, to bring your, your church out of a mindset that is a denominational mindset that will not receive other brothers and sisters that may believe differently than you. Things that aren't the essentials of having a relationship with God that is true and real. I am asking God to blow the trumpet through me, to blow the trumpet through others of awakening. The reason the code coronavirus, the COVID-19 came, God allowed it, was to ripen the harvest of multitudes around the world. For the great in gathering before his coming. And the other part of that is that he is preparing his people to be the container of his love. To be able to contain the new wine. To be able to contain the multitudes that would come in out of darkness into light in these last days. And it won't happen with a typical church order that does not allow the fullness of the headship of Christ to inhabit the body in these last days. We need to repent of the things that have made our hearts hard, the loves of the world, that have caused hardness of heart as a result so that there's adultery and divorce in churches, even though those that, husbands and wives that pray together and so on have a far lower rate of divorce than the world does. Any statistics that you hear that are contrarized by the news media and lies, and I have that in this book, exposing those lies. I mean, I touch in this book on adultery and divorce. I touch in this book on many specifics. I go in depth into tongues. I go in depth kind of into the seven essential ones of Ephesians chapter 4. There are a lot of things that are in this book that are specific as to when you should have a meeting, how you should have a meeting. All those things are just suggestions, not things you need to follow for God to move, obviously. But there are many things in there that point towards the way things should be without the specifics so that we facilitate in these last days the fullness of God's love coming into us corporately as the body of Christ and coming into our lives individually into that place where we walk in fearlessness and in victory over every trial and over every threat of darkness, whatever it is. So I just want to encourage you that the hour is urgent and I'm encouraging you to get this book and to read it if it can any way help. The other books I have coming out are in-depth teaching in the Word of God as well as in-depth against all the lies of atheism and other belief systems. And they're quite extensive. About four books will be coming out in total, four or five, including this one. Uh, they're very extensive, long books. The first one is well over a thousand pages. But that's not going to take long like these to get done because I've got almost all the writing done on it. I've got to go through and do grammar and grammar checks and other things. And add a few things here and there that I want. But should be coming out in the near future. I want you to be aware of the hour we're living in, of the urgency of the hour we are living in. You may think the Lord's coming is a long ways off. I do not believe it is. I see too many things that indicate otherwise. I will give you the picture of what I believe is about to happen in the near future. First of all, I want to I've memorized much of Matthew 24 and I want to take you to Matthew 24 there. I have a Bible here. And uh, in Matthew 24, it's very clear. 
the disciples ask Christ the question here in Matthew 24. They took him aside privately and they asked him this question, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? This is talking about the end of the world. It's not talking like some people that twist the scriptures out of the pride of their own intellectual training in some seminar. That it's all something that applied to the time around 70 AD and not today. Baloney, that's very clear here. It's talking about the end of the world. Yes, he's talking to them. And what is going to happen in their time as well, which is a foreshadowing, but he's talking mostly about what's going to happen in the very last days beyond their lifespan. And I'm not going to get into that aspect to show the evidence against such twisted understanding of the scripture that would try to belittle the book of Revelations and make it only relevant to the time uh, back in 70 AD as some people I've heard do. But I want to point out to you something in the scripture about the last days and even though I've memorized this I prefer to um, read it here. And I will start with verse 12. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. The Wycliffe Bible translators have been translating the scripture for some time. I heard one of them speak in the large Pentecostal church nearby here. I'm going to have to ignore the, the phone call for now. Um, so, um, just uh, get that later. Um, and so, what I will do is I will just get that phone call and continue with this video and cut this section out, okay? Um, I'm not going to bother because um, she can leave a message on my phone. Anyhow, I'm sorry that happened, but uh, I want to continue with this. Scripture here. The Wycliffe Bible translators indicated in this large assembly that they were going to be on their last translations around 2025. And I believe that it would only take them a short time from there. So the latest possibly that they would be finished was 2030. And this scripture would be in a very literal way fulfilled at that time, where it says, and then shall the end come when the gospel is preached to every ethnicity or nations. And then it says, after that, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. And we know what that is talking about here, most of us, the rebuilding of the temple and uh, the Antichrist setting himself up as God in the temple. What I want to point out to you is that it says in verse 21, after that, describing the details of the severity of this time, once the Antichrist sets himself up as God in the temple. It says in verse 21, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, known nor ever shall be. It is going to be a time that's going to be worse than ever before. I believe President Trump will win the next election. And he will be in power again in the United States until 2024. But I think after that, maybe a year or two after that, all hell is going to come forth upon the earth. We're seeing a bit of hell coming forth upon the earth with all of these people that are filled with demonic doctrine and darkness and the forces of hell in the United States that are looting and causing all these terrible riots and using Rodney King or whatever the person's name is, I forgot the name now, um, as an excuse for their riots. <clears throat> We see that. And 
we also see that this has happened, where hell has come forth from under the earth, onto the earth, in the past with Hitler, a terrible reign of terror. With the Japanese, which were killing thousands, I think it's in the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of the Chinese, and having contests to see who could cut off the most heads the fastest. Terrible darkness and evil. And people that don't know God. And hell is going to come forth again on the earth in the last days. It's going to be this great tribulation. And it says, except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. For the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. What I want to share with you here in the scripture is that it says in this passage of scripture about the great deception and so on and false prophets. And it goes on to say here, that the, come, that the Lord will come suddenly, after this time of great tribulation. It describes this as the time when the Lord will return, and that is clear from verse 26, I believe. No, verse 27. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. The coming of the Son of Man will be like a flash of lightning going from the east to the west. And that is referring to those that are walking as the ten wise virgins. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. In other words, like attracts light. Those that are attracted to the spirit of corruption and destruction and death will be attracted to that. Those that are in love with God will be totally in love with God and attracted to Him. And they will be taken. And it says, immediately after the, the tribulation of those days shall the sun and the moon be darkened. And the moon shall not give her light, and so on. And the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. That happens after this time of great tribulation. Well, there's a gentleman, and I don't remember his name at the moment, um, but you can look him up on the internet. He's a Pentecostal pastor who has had very powerful prophetic visitations from God where he saw that the Pope would resign and told the world that and even printed about it before it happened and told the exact month that he would resign. And everyone laughed him to scorn and uh, it didn't look like it would ever happen because it's not been a thing that's happened before in the history of the Catholic Church. Um, and so it did happen. His prophecy was totally accurate. The same man has had another powerful prophetic visitation from God. And in this, he saw clearly an asteroid hit the earth. And it was in 2029 that he believes this is going to happen. I believe the Lord gave him that date, uh, April the 13th, 2029. A powerful asteroid is going to hit the earth. It's going to devastate the earth. Well, that's going to cause the month, the, the fulfillment of what is mentioned here in Matthew. Where the moon doesn't give her light and the sun is, is darkened. That will happen from an asteroid of that magnitude hitting the earth. And there's very clear evidence of this asteroid from NASA. Of course, he inquired about it and found this all out. And I won't go into the details. You can just type it in to Google and find it yourself. And so that, if that, that, that I wouldn't be surprised. None of this is a dogmatism, but I really tend to believe that the Antichrist could be in power as soon as 2026, and you would see by 2029 in the middle of his reign, this terrible thing where the Great Tribulation is over as far as the terrible trials, and now the sun has become dark and the moon because of this impact from the asteroid. 
And then what does it say in Matthew 24 happens after that? It is very clear. It says, and then, after this darkening of the sun, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of the trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect. Those are the ones that are translated, or some people call raptured. It doesn't happen until somewhere after, or in the middle of the, somewhere in the reign of the Antichrist. He shall gather together his elect from the four winds of heaven, from one end of heaven to the other. And we also see that that is very clear from the book of Revelations, which describes in the middle of the reign of the Antichrist, when God is putting all these plagues upon his kingdom, it describes, in the middle of that, it says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. God wants us to be in that place where we are keeping our garments. We are walking in holiness, and we are in a love relationship with him, where we learn to die to the world, the flesh, and the devil, as painful as it may be, God can give us the grace to come through. And we learn to walk in the fullness of His Spirit so that we are in that place where we can be translated. And it's an interesting that at the same time as all of these events are happening, it says here, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That's also described in Revelations, where, it's, where the multitudes, everyone in the world is seeing the Son of Man come in the clouds with power and great glory. And they begin to cry for the mountains and the rocks to fall on them, as it were, and to hide them from the face of the Lamb of God. Because the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? You see, God's love is so pure. It has such integrity that it is a blazing fire of judgment against all that is contrary to love. Love being that ultimate quality that always chooses the highest lasting good over any more immediate choice of fulfillment that would obviously have in it a measure of corruption. And God's love is a blazing fire of judgment against all that is contrary to his love. But is so great that it is transcendent in mercy that he took judgment upon himself and humbled himself more than you, a mere creature, and suffered more than you, a mere creature, so that you could be reconciled to God. He is the ultimate manifestation of the ultimate perfection of love. And to reject love is to reject life, because love is the very source of life and fulfillment. In heaven, if you read the book, Imagine Heaven, you will discover that it is an amazing book, highly showing all the scientific evidence, secular journals have checked on people and realized there's something way more because they find these people are describing details after they're dead of what the doctors are saying and doing. So they've even investigated thousands of death, people that have died and said they went to heaven or hell. And they put those all together in this book, Imagine Heaven. And it's amazing to read. And so in heaven, everything has light. The light is so bright, what they say when you look at Christ, that if they know that if you were in your physical body, you'd be instantly incinerated because of the brightness of the light, of course, there. <laughs> that they're not in their physical body. They're in a body that's far superior their spiritual body there, and they will be clothed with their physical in the future, in that dimension. But in this other dimension that is far superior to the physical dimension, which is the ultra-real permanent realm, that's a better way of saying it than spiritual, ultra-real permanent. So anyhow, there they are. And they say it's the love that is in God that causes the light. 
to be so bright. And that in everyone else, it's the love in them that causes the light of their garments to shine so bright and give the message of their righteousness and of their life to others, which they can read and love one another and appreciate and esteem one another. So this is the message I'm giving to the body of Christ, is wake up. The time is short. It is time that you awake out of your sleep. Doesn't hurt to purchase this book and see if you can apply it to your local assembly or you can plant a church that allows the fullness of the headship of Christ to come down because God is calling us in these last days to conquer our communities for the glory and the praise of God. And the way we will conquer it is only if we come in to this new order where we allow ourselves to be under the fullness of the headship of Christ so that his presence literally breaks the darkness over our communities, over our cities and our town, so that we can conquer our nation where I live, the nation of Canada that has so many laws that are corrupt and evil, that are contrary to the intent and the purpose of the law which is unto the highest good. But laws are created that are contrary to being onto the highest good, that are the opposite of that. They are lawless laws that cause people and power to have control over others so that they don't have their own personal freedom, individual freedom. So it is time for us to pray and repent and come together and even fast and pray as God leads to break the darkness over our nation and to come forth and march for the glory of God and reprove the unfruitful works of darkness. So thank you for watching this video.